All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see you. Even on the television, I'm Katie Lucas. I'm the naturalist or environmental education supervisor with the Park District, and I have missed you. And eventually, we're going to start missing our butterflies, too. But even in October, you can still see quite a few butterflies. And so the presentation I'm going to give you today is it's never goodbye butterflies, because even though we stop seeing them in November, a lot of them do overwinter here. Okay, and I know that the ones that migrate and leave this area are always on our minds. So, uh, I figured October would be a great time to talk about them because we're not saying goodbye just yet. They usually taper off by the end of October. And so they're gonna be around for another month or so. We'll get right into it. So first off, what is a butterfly? Uh, you know that if, you, if you've been to my presentations, you know that I like to put them in their place as far as taxonomy goes. So here we go. Uh, what is a butterfly? Well, we know it's an animal. It finds its own food, right? So it's in that, that um, animalia, all right, section. Phylum arthropoda. So now we're into our, in, our animals that have exoskeletons. Okay, that's kind of the big indicator that they're an arthropod is that they have those exoskeletons on the outside of their body. Then we're going to move into insects, class insecta. Okay, so insects have our three body parts and they have some form of metamorphosis, most of them do. Okay, so that they go from an egg to a larva to a pupa to an adult. We also can have some simple metamorphoses like in our grasshoppers where you're going to go through several nymph stages. Okay, but these guys do have complete metamorphosis, so we're going to be looking at egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Then we're going to move down into our order Lepidoptera. So if you've ever heard anybody say they're a Lepidopterologist, okay, that's somebody who studies moths and butterflies specifically. All right, so Lepidoptera, when you're referring to both moths and butterflies, is a fairly common term. All right, but our moths and our butterflies have our complete metamorphosis, the egg, larva, pupa, they have these beautiful wings, okay? And um, Lepidoptera actually means scale wing. And so they have these little scales on their wings that sometimes fall off. If you've ever touched one, you've got a little dust on you, okay? So, um, so we've got those big wings that have scales on them. Uh, the larva in our Lepidoptera are ca called caterpillars. So moth caterpillars and butterfly caterpillars. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about, more about them in a bit. Uh, oh, I already jumped ahead of myself, so yes. Lepidoptera means scaly wing. Um, in the world, 170,000 known species, 130 species in Ohio, and give or take, you know, we have migrants that come in sometimes, but 130 are documented officially in Ohio, and I'm sure that there are some that we haven't documented yet, just because we're always learning about the environment in the uh, nature field. They are important for the ecosystem. Not only do we think that they're pretty, so they're, they have an aesthetic quality, but they are pollinators, and they are a major food source for a lot of our migratory birds. If you know me, you know I love birds, and I love to find out all about every aspect of a bird's life that I can. And a lot of our migratory birds love to feed their young caterpillars because caterpillars are just so digestible. It's like the bird's baby food, okay, because they're just super digestible. They don't have a lot of hard parts, just bags of goo, bags of, of protein, okay? So um, again, insects, so they've got the three body parts, they've got the exoskeleton, they've got the wings, they've got metamorphosis, and they do have compound eyes. So they have, um, they have that, that traditional insect eye that we see on most of our insects, okay? Um, they do have their four wings covered in scales. And then the proboscis, this is very important. So as an adult, they have a proboscis, and that is the long tongue like mouth, okay? Well, it's more of a tube, a long tube-like mouth, okay, that they can stick into flowers and drink that nectar, okay? So these guys are nectar drinkers as adults, all right? The larvae are called caterpillars, as we mentioned before. Um, and then what's really important to, to understand about Lepidoptera in general is that they require two types of food sources. We are looking at their host plant and we are looking at their nectar plant, okay? So the nectar plant is gonna be where the insect gets its food, where they're getting their nectar from as an adult. But host plants are what they need when they're young, and some of our Lepidoptera, 
okay, are really specific about what their caterpillars will eat. And their caterpillars have chewing mouth parts, so they're going to be munching on the leaves. So if you want a true butterfly garden, a true moth garden on your property, you have to plant not only nectar plants, but also host plants to, to um, support those caterpillars. Okay, so why do we like them? I already told you my number one reason. They're food for birds. <laughs> Uh, but other people might like them because they're pretty, uh, they're really, pro they do feature prominently in art, in photography. Um, people like to raise them. And um, we also have collectors out there who collect, um, collect them. And that was really popular before our digital age where you would collect a specimen and have it in a mount so that you could show your classroom or you could show um, your students at a university. Uh, but now a lot of people mostly collect photographs, which is great. Uh, they are a food source. I didn't mention spiders. I should have because, you know, that's another favorite of mine. But they are an excellent food source for spiders. Those fluttery wings get tangled up in that web, and that gives our spider a meal. Okay? And again, pollination. They are pollinators. All right. So in nature, there are so many rules and then there are so many exceptions. That's just how the world works. There's gonna be an exception for everything and I feel like there's a rule for everything too, but we're still learning a lot of the rules. So look at this slide, but just remember that on each side, there's probably an exception to that rule. Okay, so moths, nocturnal, usually. But we have several day flight moths as well. I do a butterfly survey over at Grant Park and I cannot tell you how many times I've been distracted by a fluttery thing that flies across my field of view but it's a moth and we can't count it because we can only count butterflies on a butterfly survey. That's the rule, all right? So butterflies are diurnal. We actually don't have any nocturnal butterflies that we're aware of. We have some that might fly more at dusk, but we don't have any strictly nocturnal butterflies that I know of, okay? Uh, butterflies are in general brighter in color. That's in general though. If you've ever seen a luna moth, you know that they can be a lot brighter than some of our butterflies. So again, so, so many exceptions. Butterfly antenna, they terminate into a club or a knob. Moths tend to have feathery antenna because again, a lot of our nocturnal moths are using scent to find their way to a mate and to find their flowers and their food sources, okay? Um, so here's where it can get, get a little iffy. When are you ever super close to any Lepidoptera and they're usually flying away from you and it's hard to tell, but in general, moth bodies tend to be a little hairier and butterflies tend to have a sleeker body. You almost have to be right up on them though with a magnifying glass to see that difference in some of them, especially our tinier moths and butterflies. Butterflies transform into a chrysalis. Moths spin a cocoon. And here's another thing, not all moths spin a cocoon, okay? But then you would just say it's a moth pupa. So butterflies make a chrysalis some moths spin a cocoon, and that cocoon goes around the pupa. They spin it, okay? Whereas a butterfly kind of just sheds into its chrysalis. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some pictures real quick. So this is a, a Virginia tiger moth. So this guy spins a really, really spiky, silky cocoon, okay? And then this black swallowtail chrysalis over here, you can see it's kind of sleeker, okay? So that's our butterfly. Here's a, here's a moth, all right? We've got a really hairy body and we've got that feathery antenna. But wouldn't you just say, wouldn't you just argue that that can be just as colorful as a butterfly? And so there's a lot, there's a lot of confusion sometimes with that because this is a fairly colorful moth, okay? Um, then we've got a butterfly. And did you notice that um, they are about the same colors almost? So this is a great, this is a fritillary. Um, those antenna are terminating into clubs at the end, and um, we do have a little bit of a sleeker body, but there is still some fur on it. So that can be kind of a hard, a hard telltale sign. Um, this one does come out at night, though, and this one comes out during the day. So that can be a big difference if you know your moths and butterflies, for sure. We're going to just do a general life cycle now with our butterflies. Okay, so now that we've done our comparison between moths and butterflies, we're just going to move right on into their life cycle. So eggs are laid one at a time by the female, 
And depending on the species, the eggs can be really beautiful. So this is a Mission Blue butterfly egg. It's not found in Ohio, but I liked the texture of it. It's just kind of mottled on the outside. Um, remember that she's going to lay her eggs on the host plants. So she's putting her babies right on their food source. All right, so if you see a butterfly landing on a particular plant, it's kind of fluttering around a little bit. It only stays for a little bit and then it goes to another plant of a similar species. It's probably laying eggs. All right, if it's not nectaring, it's laying eggs. Um, the females can be very picky. So there might be a plant that she senses is unhealthy and maybe she won't put as many eggs or any eggs on that plant. So they do have an ability to be picky about where their eggs are laid. Now, if there is not a host plant in the area, she is going to drop her eggs anyway. So if she never does find one, she will lay her eggs and then unfortunately those caterpillars will not survive. Okay, or if there's a subpar host plant and there's no other host plant, she will make that choice. Um, egg colors and shapes, again, are going to vary by species. I really like this image. This is from 1872, but this is a just kind of a microscopic piece of art of butterfly and moth eggs. And so you can see that different species look very different. Okay, so moth and butterfly eggs under a microscope. I just think that's such a pretty little design that they did. And then over here, here's some uh, moth eggs. You can see in relation to the female just how small the eggs are. So they, eggs can be really hard to take a photo of if you don't have the proper material. And so I have this moth, the moth eggs behind me just because I had high contrast on that image. But you can kind of see that they're quite small. These, these eggs would probably fit on you know, a pen head. So it's, they're very tiny. All right, our caterpillar, and in general, insect, insect larva. So we would say this is our larva, but we can say it's a caterpillar in our lepidopteran. Okay, so we've got this cylindrical body shape, and um, one, one caterpillar scientist said they are just basically bags of goo. And I really liked that description for them. They have thoracic legs and pro legs. So if you ever get to investigate a caterpillar close up, it can be a little hard to see. So the thoracic legs are going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, right by the head. Those are like his little six insect legs that we all know and love on an insect. Okay, And then in the back, there's these little suction cup legs that keep them on their host plant. Because remember, they're outside, the wind is blowing, the tree is shaking. They want to be able to hold tight and fast. If you've ever held a caterpillar, it can sometimes be hard to get them off your hand. Right? Um, they are very soft bodied, and again, that makes them perfect baby food for those little birds that we talked about. Very in color and size. Caterpillars are, are different. So what happens is, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. So I started thinking about clothing. But, the, but basically they do dress to impress in a lot of ways. So this is a monarch caterpillar. And what ends up happening with them is we've got these beautiful bright colors here in this particular pattern. And that's actually warning coloration. So some caterpillars like to look like bird droppings and they, they hide, so they camouflage themselves as something that they are not. The monarch chooses, well, it doesn't choose, but the monarch stands out. The monarch stands out because it is distasteful to bird species, okay? And so if a bird eats this guy, it's going to get quite sick. And so this can be a warning to predators. So some caterpillars look really, really spiky and they stand out and a lot of times that's a warning. I can sting or I don't taste good. Okay, and then other caterpillars are trying to hide. So they're dull in color or they're the color of their host plant. Okay, and yes, some can sting. So there's two different ways that a caterpillar can sting. A lot of our white caterpillars that people say not to touch are usually, their hairs are irritants. So some people might be more sensitive to a hairy caterpillar than others. So it just depends on you. You know, if you touch a caterpillar and you get really itchy, it's probably an irritant, kind of, um, kind of like uh, the hairs on a stinging nettle. Those hairs irritate your skin. Some of them, though, actually do sting. Okay, and that's like a bee sting. There's venom in there and it hurts for a while and can be a problem. So there are two different ways that a caterpillar can, can defend itself physically. Okay, not just, not just um, by, being, by being distasteful if you ingest it. Okay, and yeah, they move by walking, climbing, and crawling. So if you've ever seen one move, you know, they, they don't go too fast and that they're very close to, to their surface because they're on their host plant and they are just constantly eating. 
All right. Here we go. Um, they do go through several stages. So the larva isn't just a larva. When they hatch out of the egg, they're this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing that is no bigger than their egg. And usually their first order of business is to consume that egg. So they're going to eat the egg first, um, or at least bits of the egg or the inside of the egg, whatever's left over. Then they're going to start munching on that host plant and they are going to be constantly eating. And insects, remember, they have an exoskeleton. Their skin does not grow with them, even in the caterpillar stage. And so they are going to be constantly shedding. And we call those instars. So a second instar caterpillar is a caterpillar that has shed twice. Okay. Final instar caterpillar means that it's done its last shed, and then it's going to move into the pupa stage. Okay, so we have those, we have those instars. So if anybody ever talks about an instar, that's what it is. Um, they are extremely vulnerable in these stages, and as they're shedding, a lot of time they, they'll stay still and they'll stop eating for sometimes up to several hours, and they can be quite vulnerable during that. Okay, um, they do have those chewing mouth parts. They're going to eat plants. We do have some, and these are the exceptions to the rule, they're not in Ohio, we do have some that are predatory and we do have some that um, are parasitic, but not, not here in Ohio. This is a zebra swallowtail caterpillar. I find their, their patterning to be really pretty. Um, and this one is actually about to go into its pupa stage. It's kind of scrunched itself up and it has stopped eating in this picture. And it's gotten a little darker too. And that's how I knew that it, this one was ready to, to go into his pupa stage. Okay. Oh, I guess I'm not going. All right. I guess we're going to stick in caterpillars a little longer. Sorry about that. The slide took me by surprise. I thought it was later. So again, we talked a little bit about this already. Some sting, some have camouflage. We've got those false hairs and colors to intimidate. Unpalatable is when somebody's going to get an upset stomach if they eat it. Okay. So some of them are unpalatable. Ooh. I can't believe I forgot about this. M mimicry. Mimicry is one of my favorites too. If you haven't noticed, almost everything is a favorite with me. But, so I am fascinated by things looking like other things. And auto mimicry is really neat. So auto mimicry just means that your head looks like your rear. All right? So with our monarch caterpillars, they have false antenna on their rear. And so a lot of times if a bird tries to go for the wrong end, they can drop and get away, okay? So having your rear mistaken for your head can be a really good thing. So that is called auto mimicry. And I just think that is a really neat term and a really neat concept just because we certainly don't have that, okay? More defense, I just wanted to show you. So spice bush swallowtails, that, that one up in the corner there, um, it, its head is actually right under there, but those giant eyes make it look like a snake. Okay, and if you're a bird and you're coming in, and that caterpillar will rear up just like a snake. Okay, and that can have a startle effect on the bird, which would make it pause and give that caterpillar enough time to drop into the grass and get away. Okay, I owe moths, you don't want to touch those. They have a sting just like a bee. Okay, so they can hurt just like a bee sting. And then our red spotted purple, this one looks like bird droppings. You don't want to eat that. So those are our caterpillar defenses. All right, now we're moving into the pupa. We did took a little sidetrack there because caterpillars are pretty cool. All right, um, final shed of the caterpillar is going to create that chrysalis. Okay, so what happens a lot of times is they're going to get real still. They're going to scrunch up. Sometimes they'll hang like a, in a J shape off of a leaf. All right, they'll, they'll make a little J with their head hanging down, and then they just start wiggling. They just start wiggling, 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 and then all of a sudden, their caterpillar skin comes off, and this is left. It's fascinating. Uh, so then inside, we all kind of think nothing's happening, but there's quite a bit happening. There's no longer a caterpillar, right? The caterpillar skin came off. All the cells are rearranging. Everything is, is moving around. It's really now, instead, it's a, it's a hanging bag of goop, okay? Lots of stuff is happening in there. Lots of metabolic processes and things are firing. The whole body is going to rearrange after a certain amount of time, and this could be daylight. So if you're a butterfly and you overwinter in your chrysalis, you're going you're gonna to focus on day length to tell you when to come out again, 
All right, so as the days get longer and the weather gets warmer, you'll pop out. Some do it by temperature. So if you're a caterpillar and um, you go in your chrysalis and you're going to finish your life cycle by the end of the summer, it might be, you know, warmer climates get you out quicker, cooler days might get you out slower, okay? All right, so this, this little guy, this is the pupa right here, okay, and that's our zebra swallowtail again. Um, they're going to overwinter a lot of times in this pupa stage, and so this leaf that this guy was on actually fell off the tree, crumpled up, but the pupa just stays attached to it and just ends up in the leaf litter. So that's why when people talk about not shredding your leaves, okay, um, and actually moving them into your flower bed. That's actually one of the reasons why people encourage you to keep some of your leaves on your property because a lot of these pupa are in there, just crumpled up in the leaf and you would never know it. So my husband and I try to actually rake a lot of our leaves to our flower bed and just let them sit in the flower bed over winter and we deal with it in the following spring, okay? Um, the pupa can shift and move. So if you ever see one, they're not dead in there. They are alive and they do react to touch. The only problem is you don't want to keep bothering a pupa because they might use up their fat stores wiggling because, again, it's that startle effect. If you touch me and I wiggle, you might get nervous and leave me alone. Okay, so you don't want to keep bothering them. All right, and again, the butterfly is going to make a chrysalis and the moth is going to make a cocoon. Okay, adults are not built to last. Okay, that is the key takeaway. Most of our butterflies live much longer in their egg, larva, or pupa stage than they do as their adult. Okay, they're, they're, they're delicate, all right? These wings, they can shed those scales. So a lot of times, um, if you see a beautiful butterfly, it's usually just emerged. And if you see a very, very ratty butterfly, it's probably um, a couple weeks old, two weeks old. They really don't live much longer than that. All right, uh, they, they can get into fights with other butterflies. Birds can go after them. They can get caught up in wind. Um, and so all these things can really have a lot of wear and tear on their bodies. And so their whole goal as an adult is really just to mate and lay eggs. So they're mating, they're laying eggs, and um, they're getting fuel from nectar in order to make that happen. But after that, most of them are done. Okay, and then the next generation takes over. The only exception to that rule are going to be your migratory butterflies and the butterflies that overwinter as adults. And we don't have very many of those. We do have some. So um, eastern tail blues over here. These guys, um, I believe they are pupa during the winter, but I'm not 100% sure on them. But they're just so beautiful, and they're doing this really cool behavior called puddling right now. This is some bird droppings. Butterflies aren't always delicate and graceful. Sometimes they get their minerals from um, fecal matter, so tracks some, some scat um, and, and other things that you find in the wild. Okay? Uh, but their main goal is reproduction. They are eating mostly flower nectar. Sometimes you'll see them congregating on clay, though, to get some of those extra nutrients. All right. They can be colorful, they can be drab. I don't know that I love the word drab. I think that peck skipper is really pretty, or yellow patch, I apologize, yellow patch skipper. Um, so why can they be colorful? A lot of times it's communication, okay? So a male who is brightly colored might be showing to a female that he's very, very fit. Might be brightly colored because he's distasteful to a predator, we're not sure. Females can be just as colorful in the butterfly world as males. Um, it could also be, again, like I just said, it could be um, for defense. So, again, they could be distasteful. And so the monarch butterflies and the viceroy butterflies both um, will give a predator a very serious tummy ache. And so they do that orange and yellow display to warn those predators. Okay? And, yes, the viceroy is also toxic. It's not just the monarch. They're both toxic. Um, it could also be... Um, so migration, you never know, could be some signaling happening there, okay? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on this slide I want to cover. Do, 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 do. Nope, I think we're good. Okay, where's my time? All right. Sorry, you may need to edit that part out. <laughs> uh, so now we'll go into, um, so now I'm just going to show you some pictures. So this is a great spangled fritillary. This is an adult butterfly, and uh, they're beautiful close up. But I also wanted to show this picture because this is the proboscis that I was talking about earlier, that long tube-like tongue just coming right down into that tubular flower, getting a nice drink. Okay. 
Now we'll go a little into behavior. So with communication, um, communication can be minimal, but you're going to have some um, flutterings and some displays. Some butterflies, if they find a nice little snack in a flower, might flutter around and warn other butterflies away from it. Sometimes males can get into little scuffs, okay? Um, they also want to show to females that they are healthy and happy, so they might do some flight displays, okay? Um, several of our butterflies do migrate. The monarch migrates the farthest. Some of, ours, some of our butterflies just kind of shift down south, so we end up seeing kind of a migratory shift similar to what our robins do, okay? Um, defense, again, we've got that mimicry, we've got distastefulness, we've got camouflage. So some of our, our little skippers are um, more camouflage, they're brown, okay? Um, and then we also have erotic flight. So if you're a butterfly and you're flying along and you feel the wings, the pressure of the, the air with the wings of a bird coming for you in the, in the air, you're going to start flying erratically, okay? And that can happen. I've noticed when I've had to net some for ID, when I net a butterfly to identify it, they sometimes change their flight pattern as I do a swipe, okay? If I don't get it the first time, if I swipe the net, they'll sometimes start flying a little crazier because they want to get away from me. And usually they do if I don't get them on the first sw swipe. <laughs> uh, communication, we've got color cues and UV light, all right, and we've got um, wing vibrations. So again, they can vibrate their wings. They also do this sometimes to warm up in the mornings just to kind of get moving. They'll get into the sun and they'll vibrate a little bit. Um, so with UV light, a lot of times what I'm talking about there is they do see UV. There's a whole world of light that we cannot even process with our eyes. And so a lot of times flowers communicate to pollinators through UV whether or not they still have nectar. Okay, and we do think that some butterflies might communicate to each other with UV coloration on their bodies, but that's still a field that we're working on. Uh, they can rub wings and legs together to make noises. I have had caterpillars clack at me, so they make kind of a little noise when I open up a container to look at them. So sometimes they have little noises that they do like that, like, hey, I've got sharp teeth, don't get me. I'm assuming that's what they're saying. Um, and then they do have pheromones. So the females can release those pheromones out to the males that say, hey, I'm ready to mate, come get me. Uh, because again, if your main, main goal in life as an adult is to reproduce before you pass away, you're going to want to use all the tricks you can. And pheromones are a great communication tool because they'll just go right into the wind. All right. Migration navigation. So we'll talk a little bit about monarchs here. We're finding out that um, they're going to mostly um, use magnetic field, our monarchs do. Our nocturnal migrants are using moon and stars, and sometimes those are moths, okay? Um, monarch is going to travel the farthest at 3,000. Remember, I said we have some little shifts, you know, in populations, kind of like how we believe the robins go. So, like, our Ohio butterflies might end up in Kentucky, okay? So, some little shifts that we see in populations, all right? And then, again, defense. They are prey for many, many animals, including spiders. Um, and, but birds are a major threat because they also fly. And so we have some, some issues there because a lot of these other ones up here, they can just fly and get away. But with birds, birds can pursue in the air. And so um, birds are extremely visual. Okay, birds have amazing eyesight, and so a lot of the defenses for birds, for an adult butterfly, are going to be color and color patterning. And we see that with our bees, too, right? Bees are black and yellow. All right, so um, we have a red-spotted purple butterfly here, and um, it's got kind of this nice blue sheen to it. Um, it's actually in a completely different family than the swallowtails. We have this swallowtail butterfly that this one actually mimics. <laughs> but it's in a completely different family. So we've got this butterfly mimicking a completely not related but other butterfly that is poisonous, okay? So um, now we're gonna go into just a little bit about their host plants. To succeed in attracting butterflies, um, you have to plant for the caterpillar and the butterfly. And I know I said that before, but you have to have a variety in your garden. If you plant just milkweed, just milkweed. That can be a host plant and a nectar source, but only milkweed is only going to get you monarch caterpillars and monarch larvae. 
Um, you might get some other adult butterflies coming into nectar off the milkweed because milkweed is an amazing nectar plant, but if you don't plant a variety of host plants, that's going to be a problem. Um, there are some butterflies that rely on those violets that you see out there. Okay, so those little violets that we like to pull out of our yard, uh, there are butterflies that actually use that as a host plant. Those prairie grasses that you see out in nature, um, there are butterflies that use grasses as their host plant. It's not just flowers. And so sometimes we have to plant things that aren't going to be beautiful on the outside to make our, our garden beautiful on the outside. Okay? Um, again, many host plants are considered weeds. We have to change that perception. And the milkweed is an amazing example. I mean, every but nobody wanted milkweed in their yards 10 years ago. I mean, it was a disaster. Nobody, I mean, it's awful. It takes over everything. I have people calling me every year now, now asking me for common milkweed seeds because they now understand the importance of common milkweed and other milkweed species that they may not have even ever heard of before because we do have several milkweed species in Ohio, seven, okay? Um, many host plants are considered weeds. Let's see, we went over that. Um, Pesticides, okay, that's a big one, all right? Anything that's chewing on a leaf in your garden is gonna be affected by an, a pesticide that you put on it, all right? And again, caterpillars are chewers, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, I do raise silk moths for the park district and um, our we have to make sure that we're sourcing leaves from trees that do not have herbicide on them or um, pesticides. Okay, we just don't want um, our caterpillars dying on us, which they will do if they end up ingesting herbicides and pesticides. We do have some different groups of butterflies. I'm going to run through them quickly because I am running out of time with you today. As you know, I usually run out of time. So we're just going to, we're going to go through the different groups and then we'll, we'll go ahead and call it. Um, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to come up with um, some pictures of, of these main groups, okay? Because these are the ones that we tend to see the most and I'm just going to give you a representative of each family. Okay, so swallowtails, they've got those tails at the end of the wing. Um, they have lots of mimicry rings. So a lot of, a lot of butterflies, like that red spotted purple I showed you earlier, mimic those dark blue colors that we get with swallowtails. Okay, uh, and they're quite large. These are our larger butterflies. So this is a black swallowtail, and again, they've got the, that dark coloration that we see, those blues. This is a zebra. Uh, their host plant is a pawpaw tree. You gotta plant pawpaws if you wanna see these beautiful zebra swallowtails. And this is a smaller swallowtail, but it is one of the more striking, in my opinion. They're just beautiful in person. All right, next we have the brushfoots. This is your monarch and your viceroy category, and this is also what that red spotted purple butterfly is a part of. Okay, so we've got our red spotted purple, we've got our viceroy and our monarch in this family. They don't often have tails, okay? Gossamer wings, these are our little gray guys. Okay, so um, they sometimes have a really soft blue and they can be just very, very pretty. The gray hair streak over here is a really common one that we see in our parks. All right, and then we have our skippers. The skippers can be the hardest for the person that wants to ID butterflies because they're so tiny and they do skip. They have this skipping flight and they can be hard to pin down. All right, this is a tawny edge skipper. All brown, but it is a butterfly, okay? And then over here, this is a very large skipper. This is the silver spotted skipper, okay? And we do have both of these in our parks and in probably at St. Letters property. I've seen that you have quite a few nectar plants planted here. And so I'm sure you're seeing a lot of these if you, if you uh, head outside and take a look. Uh, then we have our whites and sulfurs. Um, the cabbage white is a European, but we consider it naturalized here in Ohio and in the United States in general. And then we have our yellow butterflies that we see all the time. Those are called clouded sulfurs, okay? Um, and I'm gonna end here on this slide just because I know I'm running out of time, but we do in the Park District have a butterfly survey that we do through the year. We contribute data to the Ohio Lepidopterist Society. Um, we walk a transect over at Grant Park and we do count species and we count individuals. And so we are looking at butterflies as a bioindicator. They can tell us if something is wrong with our habitat or with the, their migratory pathways. And so uh, we get together as a group with the Miami Valley Butterfly Association once a year and compare notes. And what we have found is that our trends in Grant Park often mimic the trends of the Miami Valley in general. 
Okay, so if it's a bad year for monarchs, usually in Grant Park, it's usually a bad year for monarchs in general. And so it's been very interesting to watch those, those patterns and see the ebbs and the flows. Uh, so I do want to thank you so much for letting me come out today and video my presentation with you. So it was wonderful, and I hope that you learned something. So thanks, everybody. Bye.